we have a lot of things coming at us. Uh, a lot of us are boomers, and now we've got parents and kids. Uh, we're dealing with those, and we're dealing with social media, all the new things that are occurring. And it, it's a, a tending to kind of freeze us. So, and even those of you who don't think you're stuck, sometimes you need, a, you know, in the Middle Ages, they had the fool. But every king had a court jester. And the court jester's job was to energize the king and the court to make sure that they weren't making stupid mistakes. He was the only person allowed to make fun of the king. As a matter of fact, there was a, a court jester. He went too far one day, and the king says, look it, uh, I didn't mind you telling jokes about me, but you told jokes about my family, so you're out of here. I want this guy killed. Get him out. So the, the, the guards started him out the door. And one of the nobles came up to him and said, King, look it. I mean, I know he made a mistake, but he's been a fool for us, a great court jester for 40 years. He said, you know, is there any way to save him? King says, bring the fool back. So the fool standing calmly in front of the king, the king says, look it, you have been a good court jester for around 40 years. And so, I, you know, but I'm a divine right king. I, you know, I speak for God. I can't change my mind. But because you've been a good fool, I'm going to allow you to choose the way you want to die. The fool bows slightly and says, Sire, if it's all the same to you, I'd like to die of old age. <laughs> so, and, you know, that's what a court jester was supposed to do. And we laugh out of grievance because, uh, you know, there's pain involved. And we laugh because of the pain of us. Why can't we come up with a very smart answer on the spur of the moment? I mean, how many times do you leave a cocktail party saying, that's what I should have said? Why can the fool do that? Well, because the fool practices. Every day his job is to turn sorrow into joy. And uh, so he's ready for anything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So our first slide um, is, has to do with the South Indian monkey trap. There's an old book. I don't know how many here read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Ah, oh, that's great. Uh, in this book by Robert Persig, there's a parable. When I was thinking about stuckness, I said, well, who's written about that? And, and I remember this parable in this book. And it's the parable of the South Indian monkey trap, which still goes on today, by the way. They capture in, uh, monkeys in South India by, uh, and they, because they cause so much problems in the kind of the suburbs. Um, and people capture them every once in a while and move them farther out into the hinterlands. But the... They, they get coconuts, and they drill the coconut with a small hole, and they clean out the inside and put some rice in the bottom of the coconut because monkeys love rice. They can smell it. They love rice. They, they tether it to a uh, tree, and the monkey comes out of the clearing, puts his hand into the coconut to get the rice, but when he makes a fist, his hand is too big for him to pull it back out, as long as he's holding on to the rice. And that's the problem. As he's trying to pull his hand out with his rice, the natives walk casually from the clearing and pick up this monkey in the coconut and throw him into the gunny sack. Because the monkey can't ask, would I rather have rice without freedom or freedom without rice? He can't see that. And so that's what, when you're stuck. Your hand is in the coconut. You can't let go of what we call its value rigidity. You can't let go of old ways of doing things, like you know things will start changing when the economy uh, starts changing. So you're, you're stuck. Uh, and so I, I want to show you three examples of this. Uh, 3M and it was, came up with glue to make the post-it notes. And when they came up with the glue, the guy that invented the glue took it to the CEO and to their executive team, and he said, I don't know what we have here, but I know it's a new product. We can stick the glue and unstick it. And the CEO, with his hand firmly in the coconut, said, when we make glue at 3M, it sticks permanently. So the guy goes away, and for four or five years, he's giving seminars about this glue and asking people to help him discover what is the product this glue will work with. And finally, Art Fry, four to five years later, says, I've been using it on little pieces of paper that I save, uh, that I mark my hymnal for, for uh, uh, songs in church. And so then I put them in one week, and next week when it all changes, I put them in again. 
And so that became the first post. They went back again. They were faced with the same thing. We don't make faulty glue. So hand in the coconut, 10 years it took before they started making post-it notes. How many millions of dollars were lost? I have that second part with the corks. Uh, I don't know if you read the Wall Street Journal last Saturday. They now do nice, uh, nice uh, articles on wine. Portugal uh, makes, so oh, I don't know, 10, 12 billion corks a year for wine. And uh, with 92 to 95 percent of the market, they never asked any questions to themselves. We run the market. We, uh, wine, uh, you lose about 5 to 7 percent of your wine every year by bad corks. So a guy in America decides, well, what if I make a plastic cork that's much better in terms of consistency? So all of a sudden, the guys in Portugal who are controlling the industry never ask any questions, hands firmly in the monkey trap, are getting blindsided by a guy in America who now produces 2 billion corks a year. And so now they're finally starting to fight back. But they, they, they get stuck in the ways of doing things. So as I'm talking about this, I want you to be thinking about is there monkey traps uh, with my group? Is there monkey traps? And you can have personal monkey traps, too. Everyone has them. The question is, do you recognize them? What are the monkey traps? Can you, for instance, set up a little committee uh, to deal with your monkey traps? Um, one of the guys I've interviewed for my book, Dave Linegar, started Remax because realtors, the National Board of Realtors, were in a monkey trap. 85% of realtors in 1978 were male. Everybody got a 50% commission, never any more than that. So Dave Leniger says, hey, this isn't fair. It's the salesperson that really brings everything to the table. I think they should get 100% commission. Well, when he told his realtor that, they booted him. So he went out and started Remax, where he pays 100% commission, and uh, he gets 1,500 or so a month from the salespeople. And now he has 100,000, 97 to 100,000 agents paying him $1,500 per month. I mean, what's the math in that one, right? The real estate uh, board and all the realtors uh, caught totally with their hands in the coconut. And so Remax totally changed the way people did business. Does that make sense to you? And, and you think about that, we're going along, doing business as usual, making all the old bromide statements. Meanwhile, the world's changing 100 times. And so, you know, how do, we, how do we find out in our businesses where our monkey traps are? We're in it, and we're, we're doing pretty well, and we don't want to change it because it's bringing us decent money. It's doing all right. We're afraid to pull our hand out of the coconut because a little money is better than something else, so we don't stand back, make the major decision. So my, my goal in this, this first part of my speech today is get a committee and, and have them go search for monkey traps and reward them and say, you know, one of the things we're going to do in this business is look for where we have monkey traps.